Uh, so welcome back, I should say, to all of you. I presume most of you have been here. How many of you actually were in this room for a class at some point? Wow, only a few of you. You must have had small classes, I guess. <laughs> Big pardon? Uh, oh, I see. Uh, yeah, the, the, the seats... The seats do look newer than the architecture, I will say that. <laughs> the architecture is older than we are, and the seats are definitely newer than we are. Uh, seats, well, there are a few places in the middle, but uh, people will find their way. Okay, well, I, um, I'm glad you're all here and interested in how Islam began. I'm interested in it, too. I, uh, it would be nice if I could tell you exactly how it happened, but uh, that's, I think, beyond anybody's capacity, really, to do. Uh, the main reason being that we have a very grave problem of sources when we talk about Islam's beginnings in the 7th century. Um, as with actually the origins of many religions, but certainly in the case of Islam, even though um, it was once said that Islam sort of started in the full light of history, I think Renan said that, uh, I kind of wonder what he'd been smoking the night before when he said that, because uh, uh, the uh, the full light of history doesn't seem to fall on the, in the, the opening events of the rise of Islam. Uh, of course, we always associate it with the person of Muhammad, the prophet of the Islamic community and Islamic tradition in the seventh century in Arabia. But we have no documents whatsoever from Muhammad or from any of his companions in the original community that he's thought to have founded. Um, we have only very uh, sparse references to the early events of the expansion of the Islamic community from uh, early non-Muslim sources um, that could be taken as maybe quasi-documentary in quality. We have extensive narrations or stories about the origins of Islam in the Muslim sources, uh, mostly in Arabic, but these are written down at least uh, a couple of hundred years after the events. And so there's always the question of, you know, is this what happened, or is this just what the people 200 years later wanted us to think happened? And there's a, often a great difference there. Um, then there's the text of the Quran, or the holy book of the Muslim tradition, which many people, including myself, think is a very early text and might be taken as having quasi-documentary quality. Um, but it's not an historical text in the sense of something that's written to explain what happened. It's a kind of text of exhortation and pious guidance, religious guidance, and so on. And teasing historical factoids, you might say, out of this thing uh, is anything but easy, and uh, it's really not a very satisfactory source for the historian who wants to sort of figure out, as we might say, what actually happened. So we have a religious tradition that we um, know a lot about from these later narrative sources, but our picture then uh, may not jive well with what, it, with what actually happened historically. And the question for the historian, like myself, is what did actually happen and how much, how close can we get to understanding that? Of course, if you go to any um, encyclopedia or any textbook that talks about the history of Islam or the history of the Near East, uh, you will find a very nice, uh, neat picture of what happened, uh, what, what I like to call the traditional origins narrative. Um, but it's based on these later sources. So um, we just don't know in what measure still uh, this is a reliable picture. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, let me sketch out in the briefest possible way the... Uh, general contours of that origins narrative, because whether it's true or not, the fact is that within 150 years or so, this origins narrative was taken by members of the Muslim community as the truth about how their tradition began. And so it really shaped the way the Islamic tradition evolved over time for many centuries <coughs> after that, right up until our own day. So you kind of have to know that story, even if it's only just a story. And I think there's more to it than just it being a story. I think it actually has some basis in reality. The question is how much. <coughs> and pardon my cough, which goes back to the early Islamic period. I had a cold. <laughs> uh, 
like a month ago, and the, the cough, you know, it was five days or whatever, but then the cough just doesn't seem to want to go away. So it will interrupt me now and then. So the traditional origins narrative, I guess we can say, begins best with the person of Muhammad, the person who's considered to have been the prophet by the um, Muslim community, uh, whose traditional dates are somewhere like born somewhere around, say, 570, uh, died in 632, the common era, <coughs> and uh, lived in Western Arabia um, in the town of Mecca where he was born, and then for the last 10 or so years of his life uh, in the city of Yathrib or Medina, uh, which is about 200 miles or so north of Mecca. Uh, according to the traditional narrations, this area was um, a pagan community or a set of pagan communities, that is, the population um, believed in many gods. They had sort of astral gods or gods that were considered to reside in stones uh, or rep be represented by forces of the weather and so on. It was not a monotheistic environment. Um, <coughs> so Muhammad grew up in this environment and that at a certain point in his life, usually around age 40, um, it is said, he began to receive revelations or seeing and hearing things which he took to be revelations from God. Uh, and the transcription or the transcript of these revelations, what happened was he would sort of be overcome by the spirit, let us say, fall on the ground kind of sweating and shaking. And when he snapped out of this trance, he had uh, a passage sort of burned into his memory and he, would re he could recite it. And the recitations then were, were soon written down by people and collected and this is what constitutes the text of the Quran. So in the eyes of Muslims, the text of the Quran is the uh, transcription of the very words of God as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Um, so what did he begin to understand from these revelations? Well, what he, the main thing he understood was that uh, there weren't many gods, there was one God. Allah, which means simply God in Arabic, so it's kind of a misleading thing when people talk about how Muslim, Muslims worship Allah, they don't worship God. Well, I mean, it's the Christians in the Arabic-speaking world worship Allah too, because it's simply the word for God. Um, and when you look at the Quran and you see how this God is defined, you realize it's the same God that's being talked about in the Old and New Testament, in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, it is the God who created the world and created mankind and sort of tries to guide us to uh, proper behavior and uh, ethical behavior. In any case, this was the basic revelation for Muhammad was that, hey, you know, we, all of these, uh, this pagan picture is wrong. There's only one God that creates the world and creates us and gives us life and gives us the bounties that uh, off of which we live as gifts kind of uh, grace of God and that it is our responsibility to recognize God's oneness and to be grateful to God for his bounties to us, for giving us life and so on. Um, and that anything other than that is really an affront to God. It's the, the gravest sin, shirk, as it's called in Arabic, associating things with God or pretending that something else is in any way equal to God. So that was the basic idea. Uh, this is what the term Islam seems to mean, uh, means uh, submission to the will of the one God. So you submit, you decide, you know, I'm not so important. God is more important, and I submit myself to his will in my life. Uh, so it was a, a, a message of uh, very strict monotheism, uh, and it included, uh, and of course based in the idea of prophecy, that is that a prophet could uh, sort of be in touch somehow with the divine spirit and receive guidance from God. Uh, it also had several corollaries or uh, subordinate features that go along with the monotheism. Uh, one was the idea of the importance of piety, that is, you should live a righteous way of life as uh, following the, the um, laws that God has set down for us uh, as enshrined in the Quran or in the Torah or in the Gospels. These are mentioned in the Quran as earlier versions of God's revelation for mankind. And if he, the Quran talks about a series of prophets of which Muhammad was the final one but there were earlier prophets that brought God's word to earlier communities, and the, the Muslim community is just seen as kind of the continuation of this process of uh, successive revelations by God to different peoples. Um, why is piety important? Well, you want to do what God tells you to do. That's just sort of a no-brainer, I suppose. But also because um, 
there is also the notion of a last judgment. The idea is that at the end of our life, we will die, we will go into some kind of, I don't know, hyperspace or something for a time, and then at the end of time, all the dead will be raised uh, and brought before God's throne for the final judgment by God, and then depending on how we live our lives, we'll either be rewarded by being sent to heaven for the rest of non-time or for eternity, uh, or we will be sent to hell to be punished for the rest of non-time. Uh, so that this whole idea of heaven and hell and last judgment is what, so shall we say, gives point to the need to be pious in your life. So these are the basic ideas that seem to have been uh, preached by the prophet Muhammad. He encountered a lot of opposition in his home community in Mecca. Uh, for one thing, the Meccans, as many pagan societies, tend to be engaged in a lot of uh, sort of ancestor worship. They uh, tended to glorify their ancestors and they, they named themselves uh, tribal names that had to do usually with an eponymous ancestor of some kind and there was kind of sanctity associated with your ancestors, your grandparents and great-grandparents and forefathers. And Muhammad was saying, well, these people were pagans, they're all burning in hell, or they will. Uh, this is not something that most Meccans wanted to hear. Anyway, he became very unpopular at home. Uh, he had a certain following, of course, of people who followed his message. Um, but uh, he was then um, made to feel, he and his followers made to feel increasingly unwelcome in Mecca. And so in the year 622, um, he and his followers undertook what's called in Arabic the Hijra, which essentially means something like migration, but it also means uh, a bunch of other things. It can mean the settlement of nomads, I think, but it also can mean sort of taking refuge. Uh, and he made the Hijra then migration to the town of Medina, or Yathrib as it was originally called. It becomes known as Medina, which means city, because it was became known as Medina the Nebi, city of the prophet, and shortened to Medina after he and his followers moved there in the year 622. And so this is an important moment because it marks the time when nascent community of followers of Muhammad uh, really becomes autonomous. Uh, in Mecca, of course, they were living within the confines or the, the context of uh, the Meccan polity and the tribal clan affiliations that ran that town. In Medina, the prophet was invited to be kind of an arbiter by the local tribal groups to be an arbiter for their disputes. And so he came in kind of as the person who was going to run the town or sort of organize affairs in the town with his followers. And so from 622, the Hijra, uh, you really have the beginning of an autonomous Muslim community for the first time. And once he arrived there, uh, we read in our narrative sources that are the source of our this nice, neat picture of Islam's origins. Um, we read about how the Prophet uh, faced some opposition in Medina too and overcame that opposition, how he uh, consolidated his control over the oasis itself, but also over uh, tribal groups that lived in the countryside around, um, brought them into the sort of community in a new way. Um, and then by the end of his time, he was able to actually take over the city of Mecca where he'd come from as well and overcome a lot of opposition with the Meccans. And he was able to overcome that and you know, absorb Mecca into this new growing statelet or polity that he was constructing in Western Arabia. <coughs> After he died in 632, his followers then embarked on a rapid process of expansion, which usually called the Islamic conquest or the Arab conquest. I don't much like the latter term. I think it emphasizes a kind of national identity quality that wasn't there at the time. It's a modern projection, but we can call it the Islamic conquest perhaps more satisfactorily. And this process saw the followers of Muhammad spilling out of Arabia in organized forces, uh, armies we might say, or raiding parties uh, that uh, moved into the territory of the two great empires of the day, the Byzantine or later Roman Empire uh, in places like Egypt and Syria and the Sasanian or Persian Empire in Iraq and Iran, uh, defeating those armies uh, in many different battles and occupying uh, increasing parts of their territory, ultimately completely overthrowing the Sasanian Empire uh, and taking away from the Byzantine Empire very large parts of that empire's territory, particularly uh, what we might call geographical Syria, uh, everything from southern Turkey down 
through modern Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and so on, all of that, and then from there into Egypt, and from there across North Africa, on the Sasanian side, occupying Iraq, and then pushing up over the next 40 or 50 years into the Iranian highlands, all the way across to the fringes of Central Asia and the borders of Afghanistan. So within about 50 years, or 60 years, this new community had somehow exploded and taken over politically a vast part of the globe that had previously belonged to the two empires. And there are, it's not easy to explain this, um, the success of this rapid expansion process. Um, if you go to the Muslim sources or ask Muslim interpreters of their own history, they would say, well, this is because God was on our side, and it proves that, you know, we were right, and okay. Um, if you go to historians who look at it in a different way, they will uh, struggle to explain how this happened or why it happened. They might say, well, the two empires had been s battling each other for centuries and they just finished the major wars and they were kind of weakened and then this sudden new force appeared on the horizon and both of them were too weak to resist it. Um, it's not clear actually how it manages to succeed. Um, to what measure it has to do with economic issues, to what measure it has to do with um, uh, zeal for a new faith tradition and sort of inspiring people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. We don't, we still don't know, I think, a lot about it. Well, in any case, whether we know or not, this is the, in a, the most sort of cursory kind of sketch, the story that you will find in a textbook or in an encyclopedia or entry on how um, Islam began. Now one thing you'll notice is that um, this movement that we talk about as expanding so rapidly, begun by Muhammad, is called Islam, always in the textbook. You know, Muhammad comes and he, he founds Islam or begins Islam as a new religious confession, and this is what the expansion is in the name of. Um, that is, it's seen that Islam as a distinct religious confession is there from the very get-go, from the first day, you might say, of Muhammad receiving his revelations. And in particular, that this new faith tradition was very distinct from Christianity and Judaism, um, with which, on the other hand, it obviously shares a lot of things. If you think about what they have in common, you will quickly realize that they have more in common than, than they uh, have differences. I mean, they believe in one God. They believe in the idea of prophecy and a revealed holy text that somehow is God's word enshrined in some form in, in a written text. Um, they believe in the importance of following God's law as revealed in these texts. They believe that uh, there's going to be a last judgment and we're all going to be judged and go to heaven and hell. So it's almost like they're variants of the same uh, religious package of ideas. When you compare it to, say, Hinduism or Buddhism, uh, there's really no comparison. These three are like three siblings, uh, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and we might include Zoroastrianism actually as a, a f close relative also in this package with all these common ideas that they share, very different from most other world religions. The problem is that when we look into the Quran to try and understand a little bit more exactly what is this new religious movement about. One of the things is, if it's so similar, if Islam is so similar to these other religious traditions, then how can we say that this rapid expansion comes because of the zeal for the new religion? All the ideas are already known. I mean, it wasn't like monotheism or prophecy or revealed sacred text was something new to people in Syria or Iran or Egypt. They'd known about this for hundreds of years. They were themselves mostly Christians or Jews or Zoroastrians, all of whom shared these ideas. So what's the big deal with this new faith? You know, why, what's so new about it? Uh, when we go into the Quran, which I take to be the best evidence for at least the thought world of the early Muslim community, that is the, it's the earliest text I think we have that comes from the community itself where we can say, okay, these are, these are guiding concepts for the community. Um, we find some interesting things. One thing we notice is that, yeah, of course the word Islam and Muslim are found in the Quran. But the text itself, the Quran itself, does not seem to be addressed to people who call themselves Muslims. It's addressed to people who call themselves mu'min or mu'minin, believers. Uh, now, there's some connection between these two words, um, but believers is definitely the, the, the concept of being a believer is what matters. 
uh, in the Quran. It, there are something like a thousand different passages in the Quran that address themselves to it's O oh, you who believe, using the, the verbal form of this word mu'min, or just talks about the believers do this and the believers do that. Um, the number of times that Muslim or Islam are referred to are far fewer, maybe 60 or 70 by comparison. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what does it mean then to be a believer if, if Muhammad was actually starting, as I like to say, a believer's movement, because I think that's what the text tells us it had, we have to think of it as. <coughs> what does it mean to be a believer? We also see, I'll come back to that in a second, um, it's not just the time of the prophet and in the Quran that we see this. When we start looking at the very uh, sparse actual documentary evidence for this new uh, community as it expands outside of Arabia into Syria, into Egypt, into Iraq and so on, we start to get 20, 30, 40 years after the death of the prophet, we start to get some real documents. We get a few papyri from Egypt, we get a few coins that the believers themselves have issued. Um, and so these are true documentary, uh, true pieces of documentation that come from the time and place itself. And what do we see? Well, we see some inscriptions that talk about the leader of this community, um, a number of them, and he's always referred to as the Amir al-Mu'minin, the commander of the believers. This, they don't call him the commander of the Muslims, they call him the commander of the believers, which confirms in my mind the fact that this community thought of itself as a community of believers, uh, that this was the operative concept for them, believers, not yet Muslims exactly. And a little later we even find around the 50s of the Muslim era, so that would be the 670s roughly, 40s and 50s, uh, six, 660s and 670s, still very early in the life of this new empire or state. Um, we begin to find a few papyri that talk about, that are dated, uh, and they'll say, written in the year 46, min qada al mu'minin, in the jurisdiction of the believers, which again sounds like the state saw itself as a community that was erected to somehow impose the uh, values of this new community in terms of judging disputes. Qada al mu'minin, the believers' uh, jurisdiction. So, this notion of believerdom, if you will, or being a believer's movement, I think, is really, we have to say, the sort of basic concept that uh, informs these people's self-conception. So who then were these believers? What did they believe? Well, again, the place to start, I think, is the Qur'an, because we don't really have any place else that we can go to find out for what a definition of a believer is. And when we look at it, well, it says, of course, the believers should worship God, and they should uh, be mindful of God at all times of day, and they should do good works of various kinds. You should should do this and shouldn't do that, and so on. This is to be expected. Um, but it, some verses in the Quran make it very clear that some of the so-called peoples of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, the term usually, uh, well, clearly means from various passages in the Quran, it becomes clear that it means Christians and Jews are referred to generally as peoples of the book because they had received their revelations earlier. Um, and it makes it clear in some passages that some of the peoples of the book were among the believers or considered among the believers and would attain salvation on the last day. Now, this is a very interesting concept. Uh, it suggests that the construction, our construction of Islam as a religion that starts completely different from Christianity and Judaism uh, is a little bit skewed or maybe a lot skewed at least as it was at the very beginning. It looks like at the very beginning what we have is a kind of monotheistic revival movement that could include Christians and Jews if they were adequately pious in their behavior because they did believe in one God and they did believe in the last day. Um, and so they could be included in this movement. There is also, a, a, what can I call it? an almost document, I don't know. Um, there is a text which is found in the later narrative sources, the Chronicles and so on, in several different ones and dif different copies of it, they're almost identical, uh, which is sometimes called the Constitution of Medina. And what it purports to be is a copy of a document drawn up by Muhammad with the people of Yathrib, the people of the city that he moved to at the time of the Hijra. Uh, now this document, 
it's not a document in the proper sense because we don't have the original copy. We have a literary transcription of something that's said to be a document. Now, is it a total forgery or not? Well, everybody who looks at this thing, including me, but uh, including a lot of scholars who are very, very skeptical about the reliability of these later sources, they look at this transcription and they say, this has got to be a transcription of something really old, really early. Because if you were at a later time trying to invent such a document, you would never invent it in this way. It has too many weird archaisms of language. It has too many strange things in it that can't be explained according to the sort of traditional narration of how things developed. You know, if you were inventing something later on to foist it back and sort of project it back to the origins, you would, you would never have come up with this. So the, the general consensus is that this text uh, is, in fact, something like a transcription or a partial transcription, partial transcription of an actual early document that somehow survived. And when we look at this thing, it's very interesting. One of the things we see in it is that it speaks explicitly of Muhammad's nascent community in Medina as including Jewish clans of Medina. It says there are these Jewish communities and they're, uh, they are part of the ummah, part of the community. We are one community apart from other communities, but the Jews are part of our community. So it, it, this also suggests that there's some um, way in which this early community of believers included many different kinds of people, perhaps. Uh, maybe we might call them the Quranic believers, people who had been pagans and, and who followed the Quran. Uh, and so they, they get incorporated in, into it. They would be sort of the standard kind of Muslims, we might say. But then there are also included in this community Christians and Jews, perhaps, who were adequately righteous or pious in their behavior and who became part of the community as well. This, of course, changes our perception of everything about how this community evolves subsequently because and when we see it expanding rapidly, if you think of it as a Muslim community expanding at the expense of, say, Jewish and Christian communities, you know, it's us and them, and the line is between Muslims on the one hand, Christians, Jews, and others on the other, uh, well, you get a very kind of uh, confrontational picture. If you imagine it as a kind of monotheistic revival movement, um, preaching to people who are already, in most cases, monotheists, like Jews and Christians, uh, or quasi-monotheists like Zoroastrians, uh, and then seeing that some of those monotheists are actually part of your movement, it takes kind of the edge off it a little bit. Um, if you were, for example, a Christian or a Jew in Palestine or Egypt, and these people came preaching to you, it wouldn't be necessary for you to give up your faith. You could become a believer, join the movement, and stay who you were. You could be a Jewish or a Christian believer in the believer's movement. It was a kind of monotheistic, uh, broader, uh, broader in definition uh, than the traditional picture would, I think, allow. And when we look at the reports that tell us about the early um, empire that emerges under the so-called Umayyad dynasty starting in 660, the ones who come to run this thing, from the early Umayyad period, from 660 to around 700, um, many different sources make it quite clear that there were lots of Christians in particular who were important in the early believers' movement. Once it, gets, it, it moves its sort of center of gravity from Arabia out to Syria, the capital becomes, well, somewhere in Syria, Damascus is often the capital, it seems. <coughs> and when we, when we look more closely, we find that there are lots of Christians serving in the military service of this new state, in the armies as it expands. Uh, and there are some really important uh, high officials of the state, advisors to the caliphs, as we call them, to the Amir al-Mu'minin, commander of the believers, um, who are Christians. You've probably heard of St. John of Damascus. He was one of them. He's, he's considered to be a saint in the Christian church, but in his earlier years, he, he was actually what you might call the prime minister for the commander of the believers in Damascus. So all of this tends to uh, imply that the original believers' movement was not so clearly defined as a separate religion uh, distinct from other monotheisms, but was rather a monotheistic revival movement emphasizing piety and strict observance of the revealed law. This is, a, again, a different picture from what you get in the traditional narrative and also what you get in the textbooks based on the traditional narrative. <coughs> we see interesting... Um, uh, there's other bits of interesting evidence um, that we can draw on here too. 
there's some archaeological evidence now that's very uh, come to light recently that's quite fascinating. Um, a church not far from Jerusalem that was excavated 15 or so years ago, um, and it was rebuilt several times. So the first construction is in something like the 5th century, and then it's rebuilt in the 6th century. And it's rebuilt subsequently in about the 8th century, uh, early 8th century, um, so under the Umayyad dynasty. Uh, well, of course, it has an apse in the east. But in the south wall, there's a niche, there's a niche, a mihrab, a prayer niche for Muslims in this church. So the question is, what kind of cohabitation is going on? What is this building being used for? It's, uh, it was a church with, you know, did was there a Muslim, as we would say, community that was praying towards Mecca, also meeting in this church? Were they meeting at the same time with the Christians who were praying to the east? What is the relationship between, we don't know, but the fact that you have one building with both of these um, features, an apse in the east and a prayer niche in the south wall, um, is very suggestive. <coughs> There's my early Islamic cough again. Um, and we also find in the later narrative sources some very suggestive reports that say, well, of course, they couch everything in terms of we the Muslims. And they've already made this change into thinking of themselves as strictly as Muslims, different from Christians and Jews. They say when the Muslims arrived in Damascus, uh, they took over the Church of St. John, which is the big church, which is now the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. And they divided it in half. And the Christians prayed in one half, and the Muslims prayed in the other half. And there's a similar report about the city of Hama, I think, and maybe a couple of others. Now, we don't know exactly what this means. What, what kind of memory is this? Is this some kind of effort to explain or justify the fact that the Muslims ultimately took over the Church of St. John and made it into um, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, which I hope you all go have a chance to see someday when things settle down in Syria a little bit. It's a wonderful uh, monument. It's still there. <clears throat> but it is very suggestive that there is this um, close association of for ritual purposes of you know the Muslim prayer hall and the Christian prayer hall, we might say, in the same place. Uh, we don't know how Muslim ritual evolved exactly. A lot of the basic Muslim rituals are mentioned in the Quran, but they're not defined or described in the Quran. It just bits of them are referred to, so we know that Muslims prayed in the Quran. So in Muhammad's day, they must have prayed. And we know that their prayer involved bowings and prostrations because those are mentioned. But it doesn't say how many prayers a day you have to do. It doesn't say uh, exactly how you, you do the prayer ritual. And it may be that, that the way Muslim prayer evolved was very heavily influenced by the way Christians and Jews prayed in the late antique world. Because certainly Christian prayer, at least in the late antique period, also involved prostrations and, and bowing and so on. So we don't know... Uh, how this process of ritual crystallization in the early, what becomes the early Muslim community took place. But the uh, coexistence of these communities uh, in this, what seems to have been a sort of open, um, more ecumenical monotheistic revival movement is very suggestive. Well, this expansion of the early community and the early, becomes an early state uh, is a case of state expansion. And so it was a conquest that involved armies and defeats of others' armies, as I suggested, with defeat of the Byzantine and Persian armies, um, are recorded both in Muslim sources and non-Muslim sources. <coughs> but most of the towns and villages of the Near East seem to have capitulated peaceably. Uh, in any case, there's no evidence of destruction uh, in the archaeological record uh, to mark this so-called Islamic conquest. A very few exceptions, the city of Caesarea was besieged, and we see ever, that's reported to us in our chronicles, later Muslim chronicles, and we do see evidence of, of a siege in Caesarea. We, we can, and there's a burning layer and so on when the city finally fell. Um, but this is almost unique. Uh, in hardly any other place do we find any trace of a conquest of a forcible change of rulers. Now, it isn't to say that there wasn't some force involved. If you have an army camped outside the city, you know, you might capitulate and the city would stay intact. But the fact is that um, for archaeologists, it's sort of become now um, a commonplace to observe that uh, the Islamic conquest is archaeologically kind of invisible. You cannot see it in the material record uh, going from layer to layer in the archaeological record, it just doesn't show. Um, 
no, the pottery doesn't change right away. You know, there isn't a sudden change of material culture. There's no destruction layer to mark it. We don't know. Which, of course, makes it much more complicated to date things. If you get something from a certain late, and you say, is this late Byzantine or is this early Islamic? Well, it was pretty hard to know because the culture was the same for 50 years there. And you don't know which side of the apparent barrier between pre-Islamic and Islamic this might fall on. There doesn't seem to have been any or don't, don't seem to have been any demands either that people brought into this new state convert to something immediately. These Christians and Jews mostly who lived in these towns were already monotheists. So as long as they uh, paid their taxes to the new government, uh, everything was cool, right? They didn't have to make any changes. There was no need to convert to anything. They were already monotheists. If you were a pagan, then you'd have a hard time because as I said, for the believers movement, the idea that there was one God and you had to honor that fact or uh, acknowledge that fact was something that they wouldn't compromise on. Uh, but if you were already a monotheist, you were sort of, in a sense, already saved. You're already there. So it means that archaeologically, the, um, the record isn't going to show the conversion to Islam or the transfer to Islamic rule, as you might say, the rule by this new state that starts in Arabia and then spreads out into the Near East. When then do we, can we really talk about the emergence of Islam? When does Islam really appear for the first time as a distinct religion from the matrix of the believers movement? As far as I can tell, this happens towards the end of the seventh century, say in the 690s or early 700s. And it's associated, I think, especially with the person of the Amir al-Mu'mineen or commander of the believers or caliph, uh, Abdul Malik, who ruled at that time. What we see is beginning at this time is an increased emphasis on the importance of the person of Muhammad himself as the prophet, emphasizing his prophecy, which is something that, let us say, other, other believers like Christians and Jews might not have accepted so readily. This would have been a problem for them, perhaps. So the emphasis on the prophet Muhammad and the emphasis on the Quran as the key sacred text uh, were the things that are the kind of the hallmarks of a newly crystallizing sense of Muslims as a, as a separate religious identity or confession distinct from Christianity and Judaism. And sometime around this time, I think, uh, there's a kind of uh, redefinition of the leading cadres of this community who were of Arabian origin. And they began to say, well, you know, these Christians and Jews who are believers, uh, I'm not sure they're really believers. You know. Now, it's not clear, you know, they, they have some funny ideas about Jesus being God. We, uh, it's very hard for us to accept this. Um, and so I think what happens is that it's somewhere around this time, there's a kind of redefinition of the core group in the community as Muslims uh, that defines the Christians and the Jews of the earlier movement out of the movement. So now they're, they're no longer part of the movement, and Islam, as we can call it, uh, becomes a separate religious confession. And I think they begin to focus on the term Islam at this time also as a way of, of um, finding a term that's in the Quran that is distinctive for them, the people who follow the Quran. Um, they start downplaying this term believer. They say, well, it means the same thing as Muslim. And they don't, they don't date anything any longer using this old formula uh, with the Qada al-Mu'mineen, the jurisdiction of the believers. They sort of bury that terminology and they start talking about this, well, these are years of the hijra, years from the time of Muhammad's hijra or migration. That marks the beginning of our community. So they, they start renaming or relabeling things, practices and um, concepts that they had developed in the first hundred years or so in order to make them look distinct from Christianity and Judaism and other religious traditions and to give themselves a kind of new um, uh, coherence <clears throat> as a new religious community. So this shift from the believer's movement to Islam um, is, I think, a really important thing that takes place around the year 700. It's very hard to know. And it's also, I, mean, I think it was probably led by official decrees and official policies. We see it, for example, in the Dome of the Rock constructed by Abdul Malik and his advisors on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, that beautiful golden building that you know is there. And it has inside it uh, mosaics with inscriptional texts, which are selections of passages from the Quran. And they've selected the passages from the Quran that emphasize uh, the fact that um, the Trinity is, is not acceptable. 
Uh, so th this sort of seems to be drawing a line between the new sort of newly discovered Muslims and Muslims who have sort of really gotten a new sense of themselves and Christians who believe in a Trinitarian concept, which from the point of view of Muslims, you know, how can three be one? You know, this is not, not something that they uh, accept. On the other hand, there's, it's also possible that this shift from believers to Muslims was something that was not entirely led by official policy from the top down and trickle down, but where the official policy was responding to a kind of a uh, more popular set of changes in popular opinion that we're realizing that mm, maybe among Christians and Jews, that these Arabian believers really aren't like us and uh, they're somehow different. So in any case, whether it was from the bottom up or top down or simultaneously both, uh, we start to see this process of sort of uh, differentiation whereby uh, Islam and Muslims can really identify themselves as a distinct community, uh, even though they had begun in a much more ecumenical kind of movement that had a lot involved uh, Christians and Jews, let's say, um, in the original foundational uh, efforts. Well, of course, all of this means that when today or any period in the past, uh, we look at um, what is Islam, how is it constructed, and people always want to go back to the beginnings to see what something is about, right? Well, if you go back to the beginnings, as far as I can tell, you're going to find something really quite different. And uh, it, it opens all kinds of, it creates problems sometimes for people in interpretive terms, especially for Muslims, but it also opens up all kinds of opportunities, I think, uh, of creative reinterpretation of sort of how Muslims should behave today. Of course, as you probably know, one of the things about Islam today and really ever since the time of the Prophet Muhammad is that there's no single authoritative source for what Muslim doctrine should be. It's not like the Catholic Church where, you know, the Pope makes a decree or an encyclical or something and that's, that's doctrine and, you, and Catholics have to follow it. There's no such thing in Islam. There's no uh, Pope in the Islamic tradition. Um, there are lots of very learned people. Historically, there were lots of different people who were very learned, but of course they disagreed about all kinds of things. And so you had different opinions, sort of the battle of intellectuals in the community, and whichever one seemed to be the most persuasive or important was the one that held sway, but different ones were always uh, favored in different places. So there's no single Islam today, and nor has there been for centuries. Uh, and so a reinterpretation of the origins, of course, then provides even more uh, scope for um, all kinds of flexible new possibilities for how Muslims might um, engage with the world around them today. I think I've talked long enough, and uh, if you have any questions, we can entertain them. Thank you.